week, we looked at some biblical examples of uh, characters who were discouraged. <clears throat> but I want to go back to the, the other slide as we begin, the first slide that we start with, and uh, <clears throat> emphasize a point there. Now, this slide that we have on the screen is dealing with uh, trust in God. And that's what we're going to focus on tonight. By trusting in God, we can get that encouragement that we need. We can increase our faith. It will help increase our hope, a greater obedience to God, and certainly courage as we look at the lesson tonight. So tonight I want to start by looking at some biblical characters as we look at overcoming discouragement tonight. Um, some biblical characters who really um, put their trust in God. Now, last week we tried to focus on those who became uh, discouraged, but tonight we want to look at some biblical characters, and I'm just going to spend just a moment um, on each of these, because if I, I could take the whole class on each one of these, but we want to start with Noah. Noah put his trust in God. When we look at Genesis chapter 6, we see in that study that God had decided that he was going to destroy man that he had created. In verse 5 of Genesis 6, the Bible says, And the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth. Every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. But the Bible tells us also that Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. And so as we look back to this story, we know that when we look at Genesis chapter 6, God said in verse 3, My spirit shall not always strive with man, for he, he, he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. Now we know as we look at the New Testament in 2 Peter chapter 2 and verse 5 that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. And so Noah preached for over 100 years. But out of all that preaching, uh, how many souls were saved? How many? I'm going to let the class answer that for me. How many souls were, were saved out of all that preaching? Just eight. Just Noah, his wife, their three sons, and their wives. Now that tells you the world was really wicked. And Noah, because of the instructions he received from God, was instructed to build an ark. God says, I'm going to destroy man that I've created because it's just, the world is corrupt. And so as we look at things that are happening today, we look at sin, we see corruption. Um, we can go back and see from Genesis 6 the thing that God was, uh, was dealing with there. And of course we know that Noah followed God's instructions and he built that ark. And I always like to emphasize uh, Verse 22 in Genesis 6. Thus Noah did according to all that God commanded him. You know, God told him to build the ark of gopher wood. He did that. He didn't go out looking for another kind of wood. Whatever God instructed him to do, he did it. And then, of course, we look at Abraham. He, he trusted in God also. Um, when we look at Abram in Genesis chapter 12 and we see God telling Abram to leave his home, leave his country, uh, just think if God would visit with us tonight and tell us to leave our country, leave our home. Boy, that's a, that's a challenge. But Abraham did it. He left Haran. He was 75 years old when he left. Now, of course, at that time, his name was Abram. God changed his name in Genesis 17, in verse 5, to Abraham. But as we look at 
Abraham, we see that he was uh, willing to obey God. He put his trust in God. And that's the point I'm trying to emphasize as we look at these characters tonight. We're just going to look at a few of them for a few minutes because we could talk more about each of them. And then also we, we have on the screen Genesis chapter 22, and we know what took place there when God tested Abraham, told him to take his son Isaac, and he had waited some 25 years for Isaac to be born, but to take Isaac and offer him up as a sacrifice. And we see Abraham getting up early in the morning, getting ready and did carry out ready to carry out the commandment of God. We know that he was only stopped by an angel that called from heaven and told him to do thy son no harm. But I'm just trying to show a picture, make a picture, so you can see that these characters that we're looking at right now, they put their trust in God. And then, of course, the next one is uh, Moses. Moses put his trust in God. We know he had trouble offering excuses to God, but finally he went back to Egypt and uh, took a message from God to Pharaoh to let his people go. And we know the Bible gives us in Exodus those plagues, some ten plagues that were brought up on uh, Egypt. And it was only after that 10th plague, the firstborn destroyed, that Pharaoh decided, I better let these people go. And we know how blood was taken and put on the lintel and the doorposts. And because of that, the death angel of God passed over those houses of the Israelites. And then Pharaoh decided that he better let God's people go. But that wasn't enough. After they got out there on the journey, Pharaoh started chasing after them. And remember, God told Moses to stretch out his rod across the sea, and the Red Sea divided, and east wind came, took care of the water, and the Israelites marched through on dry ground. As I was uh, looking at this great story uh, of how these people left Egypt. I was reading in Exodus chapter 12 in verse 37 of those people that left Egypt. The Bible says 600,000 men on foot besides children. And then it also says in the next verse a great deal of livestock. <laughs> and I'm just telling you Moses had a tremendous task. When you think of 600,000 men, didn't mention the women, but it did mention the children. So just wanted you to know from that that he had a tremendous task of trying to lead these people, not only human life, but he had a great deal of livestock as well. So he had a tremendous task, but he also trusted in God. And then, of course, the next character that we'll look at tonight is, is Joseph. And what a great story. I wish I had time to talk more about Joseph. We know one of the uh, sons of uh, Jacob. Jacob made him this coat of many, many colors, and because of that, jealousy developed among the other brothers. And Joseph, of course, saying that the other brothers were going to bow down to him. And they took Joseph... Um, threw him in a pit, took him out of the pit and, and sold him for 20 pieces of silver to the Midianites. Then when he got to Egypt, he was sold again to Potiphar. He was falsely accused, put in prison. And then, of course, you know, he interpreted dreams for Pharaoh, seven years of plenty, seven years of famine, and it's interesting, the only place you could find food was in Egypt. <laughs> and guess what? His brothers came to Egypt to get food. 
And Joseph didn't reveal himself to them right away, but later on, he did. And he told them, you meant evil against me, but God turned it into good. And I'm kind of paraphrasing that in chapter 50 of Genesis chapter, or well, Genesis chapter 50, if you want to read that. But as we kind of look at him, we see that uh, he trusted in God. And that's what we need to do today. I was looking just the other day at the pandemic of 1918. In, it, in 1918, it was estimated that 700,000 people died of that pandemic in 1918. I was looking at a picture that my cousin sent me from Montgomery. And she, the picture, and I have it on my phone, I we should have put it up for you to see it, but in the picture, there's a football game going on at Georgia Tech. And guess what? The people are sitting there with their mask on. <laughs> now, this was back in 1918. <laughs> we may get that up, Michael, before the class is over. So people can see. It seems like history is repeating itself. If you look back to that date and look to what we're doing today, wearing masks. But as we move and move further and look also at uh, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. Just wanted to emphasize the support of these people, how they trusted God, these Hebrew boys. You know, the king had said had made this golden image and told everybody who does not bow down will be thrown into a furnace of fire. Well, these boys, these men, they refused to bow down to that golden image. And when we look at scripture, they said, our God is able. But even if he does not deliver us, we still will not bow down to this golden image. You're talking about trust in God. They had it. They were taken and thrown into that fiery furnace. The Bible says they heated the furnace, seven times hotter than it was. The Bible says there, as we look in Daniel chapter 3, that those men who threw them in to that furnace, they were killed. But when the king looked in, he saw four men. They were loose. They had no hurt on them. And it says the fourth was like the Son of God. So I think as we kind of look back at these stories in the Old Testament, we can see that these biblical characters trusted in God. Noah trusted in God. Eight souls saved. Abraham had his trust in God. Moses, Joseph, Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. And then I put also the Apostle Paul from Romans chapter 8 as he makes a, his commitment to the Lord and talks about who shall separate us from the love of Christ, and talks about all the things in life that can, can separate us. And then Philippians 1.21, for me to live is Christ and to die is gain. That's how he looked at life. Now I wanted to use that as a backdrop this evening as we have moved from our lesson last week, and now we are going to look further into how we can trust in God. The things that we need to do to trust in God. We're going to go through a number of points as we emphasize what we need to do as Christians to put our trust in God. And let's begin with the first one that we have on the list. God has promised, so God has promised to supply every need we have in life. And that's really our first slide that we have on the screen that we started out with tonight, that God will supply our every need. But we have to be willing to put our trust in God. When we look at the promises of God, 
We also need to realize as we think about the promises, we look at 2 Peter chapter 3 in verse 9. Let's just hold that scripture that's on the screen. I want to go back and just emphasize 2 Peter 3 in verse 9. For the Bible says, the Lord is not slight concerning his promise, as some count slightness, but is long-suffering toward us, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So we serve a God who is not slight concerning his promises. And God has promised to supply every need we have in this life. We have on the screen also 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3. The Bible says there, as his divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness through the knowledge of him who called us by glory and virtue. So God has given us all things. Didn't say some things. All things that pertain to life and godliness. We can find these things in God's word. And then also as another promise that we need to focus on tonight, God has promised that his grace is sufficient for us. And of course we know we take this from 2 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul had the thorn, remember, in the flesh. And how many times did he ask God to remove it? Three times. <laughs> now, didn't God hear him the first time? Sure, he heard him the first time. But he asked him a second time. And then he asked him a third time. And finally, God says, I'm not going to remove it. But what? My grace is sufficient. You see, sometimes in life when we have boulders in our path and we go to God in prayer and ask him to remove those boulders out of the way, <laughs> maybe we're asking the wrong question. <laughs> maybe we ought to be asking God to give us enough courage, enough strength to climb over these boulders that are in our path instead of asking him to remove them out of the way. So God didn't remove the problem that Paul had, but he said, my grace is sufficient. And I believe as we go through this pandemic, you know, I, I tried to find out uh, from this uh, Spanish flu, that's what it was in 1918, the Spanish flu that killed almost 700,000 people. As I looked at research on that, I tried to find out how long did this Spanish flu last? <laughs> now, I don't know, you know, you can't believe everything you read on the internet and on Google, but anybody wants to guess how long they said it last, lasted? What? No. Two years. Who said that? Two years. Ashley. It lasted two years. Now, we're talking about a vaccine. <laughs> but, you know, somebody said, they're rushing this vaccine. I don't want to rush out and take it. <laughs> you know, I don't want to be the first one to take it. If they're rushing it, it may not be. It may solve our problem. I hope it will. I'm praying that it will. But uh, this COVID-19, I hope and pray it doesn't last two years. You know, maybe we're more advanced today. You think about 1918, and I got a friend that I walked with, and he was telling me, he said, my dad was born in 1918. Now, of course, his dad, dad has passed on, but... Um, is something to think about. How long will the COVID-19 last? We don't know. But we have to keep praying and trusting in God and asking him 
to help us get through it. And I believe he will. We just got to keep our faith in him. All these biblical examples that we just looked at of people who trusted God. You know, it was not raining when Noah was building the ark. People standing around saying, that man is crazy. Have we seen people standing on the street corners in Rome? <laughs> and we say, those people, something is wrong with that, those people. But I'm sure people were saying, Noah is a crazy man. He's building this big old ark, and it's not raining. <laughs> but then it started raining. Why do you think God didn't allow, and this is a question for the audience, why do you think the Bible says that God locked the door? Why do you think he didn't let Noah lock the door? What? All those people. Yeah. It may have been that Noah, you know, may have had some compassion or whatever, empathy. But the Bible says God locked the door. But, you know, people didn't believe it was going to rain. But then when it started raining, it was too late. But let's go on to another one as we look at another promise. God has promised a way of escape when temptations come up on us. You know, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such is as common to man. But God is faithful, who will not allow you to be tempted beyond what you are able. But with the temptation will also make the way of escape that you may be able to bear it. So God will, will make a way. We also have on that Daniel chapter 6, verse, verse 16 through 23. You know what that's all about. That's about Daniel when he was taken and thrown in the lion's den. Did God make a way? <laughs> you bet he did. He sent an angel all the way from heaven to that lion's den. And they sh that angel shut the mouths of those lions that Daniel was not hurt. Will God provide for us today? And that's what I'm trying to say tonight, folks. We don't need to get so carried away with this Spanish flu, I mean with this uh, COVID-19, that we forget that we serve a God who's in control. Now we need to use, you know, the CDC guidelines and follow those, but we also need to trust in God and know that he'll provide for us and uh, make a way for us. Anybody has a comment? Okay, um, let's look at another one. God has promised Christians victory over death. Isn't it beautiful to know that we will have victory over death? 1 Corinthians 15, 54 through 58. I believe I'll read that one from the Bible. I have it already typed out, but I want to just read it from the Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and the verse starting with verse 54. The Bible says, so when this corruptible has put on incorruption, and this mortal has put on immortality, then shall be brought to pass the saying, that is written, death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your sting? O Hades, where is your victory? The sting of death is sin, and the strength of sin is the law. But thanks be to God who gives us the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, 
always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your labor is not in vain in the Lord. And then another one as we think about putting our trust in God, another point that we can emphasize, God has promised that all things work together for good to, to those who love and serve him. When you think about this, think about, think about Joseph. Look at how much he suffered. <laughs> Sold by his brothers, sold by the Midianites, went to prison. Another point that I didn't emphasize a little while ago about Joseph, when he interpreted those dreams for Pharaoh about the seven years of plenty and the seven years of famine, he was elevated to second in command. <laughs> Nobody was above Joseph but Pharaoh. And that's when his brothers came. I mean, he was in, in charge because Pharaoh was letting him uh, run the country, the country at that time. So all things will work together, but we have to keep our trust and faith in God. We can't give up. We can't quit. And then as we look at another one, God has promised salvation to those who obey Jesus Christ. And you know, for the life of me, people can read this scripture and they can leave with different interpretations of what God is saying. People who are saying that, well, you don't, you're already saved before you're baptized. That's not what this scripture says in Mark chapter 16 and verses 15 and 16. And of course, we can, we can read it from the Bible but when we, when we look at this scripture, Jesus is very clear about those who will be saved. So in Mark 16, 15 and 16, and he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. We have to believe that. We have to trust the promises of God. Hebrews 13 and 5 is another one. God promised Christians that he will never leave us nor forsake us as we move to the next one on the screen. That he'll never leave us nor forsake us. Of course, you know, this was a promise that was made back in Deuteronomy. This was also a promise that God made to Joshua in Joshua chapter 1 in verse so we ought to be confident to know that God will always be with us, but we need to also stick with God. Another one as we look at, in him we have redemption. The Bible says God has promised forgiveness of sin to all who believe and obey Jesus. In Ephesians 1 and verse 7, in him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And then, of course, we need to realize that God has promised uh, us a home in heaven if we are faithful unto death. In Revelation 2.10, John the Apostle challenged the church of Smyrna not to fear any of the things they were to, about to suffer he even said some of them would be cast into prison for 10 days and be tested. But he said, be faithful unto death and receive the crown of life. So we look forward to that, that crown of life uh, that will never fade away. And I think the Apostle Paul said, said it another way as we look in uh, 2 Timothy he used another description in 2 Timothy chapter 4, trying to help encourage us along the way. He says in, first, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, beginning with verse 6, For I am already being 
poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure is at hand. I have fought the good fight. I have finished the race. I have kept the faith. Finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will give to me on that day, and not to me only, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So, what a great honor. Things that we can look forward to as a Christian, as we stay in the race and fight the faith. We know also in John 14, Jesus is saying, I am the way. He himself is the way, the truth, and the life. No man can come to the Father but through him. So we only have but one way to get to heaven, and that's through Jesus. Then as we recognize also another promise that we have in the Lord. The Bible says God has promised to answer the prayers of the righteous. You know, sometimes we, we um, can get confused because, you know, God does not walk on our clock or our timetable. We take a problem to God and he may say yes, he may say no, um, or he may say later. But the Bible gives us the assurance uh, and I'll just read this one from my notes. 1 Peter 3, verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and his ears are open to their prayers, but the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. So the eyes of the Lord, you know, are on the righteous. Um, I, I think of the scripture in Psalms 37 where the psalmist says the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. <laughs> or the steps of a good man are directed by the Lord. We ought to be thankful that we as Christians can um, continue to walk in God's way and look forward to uh, a crown of life. Look forward to God answering our prayers, you know, taking a matter to him and, and leaving it with him and knowing that whatever his answer is, that he's going to do whatever is best for us. Sometimes we don't realize that. But when we take a matter to God, he knows all. He knows our needs and he knows the things that we need in this life. And so when we take it to him, let's let him take charge and know that he hears our prayers and that he will answer according to his will. Then, of course, as we look at another promise that we have, God has promised to comfort us when we are burdened down with troubles. 2 Corinthians 1, verses 3 through 4. Blessed be the God and Father, of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our tribulation, that we may be able to comfort those who are in any trouble with the comfort with which we ourselves are comforted by God. And then, of course, we have on the screen 2 Corinthians 7, 5 through 10. Uh, Titus brought some good news from the church at Corinth. And he comforted Paul with that good news of a brother turning from sin. And uh, he shared that with him. We're not going to take the time to read that. You can read it if you would like. So that's important to note. And then as we look another, at another, God has promised rest for those who die in the Lord. Revelation 14 and verse 13. The Bible says, Blessed are the dead who die in the Lord, that they may rest from their labors and their works. Follow them. What a blessing to know that the good things we do, 
that those things will follow us as we reach out and help one another, help others. And then on this list, God has promised, the next one, God has promised us a place where there will be no more pain, sickness, no more tears, no more death, and no more sorrow. You know, we read that from Revelation 21, verse 4. God will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there shall be no more death, no more sorrow, no more crying. There will be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. And so in conjunction with this lesson tonight, I wanted us to uh, close by looking at some things that we will not do in heaven. Just a list of those. We'll talk through these and then the lesson will be uh, yours. But let's start off with the first one. You will never go to the medicine cabinet in heaven. Not going to be any sick people in heaven. <laughs> I mean, you just don't worry about taking any medicine with you. You were not going to need it. Not going to be any sick people in heaven. Another one. You will never attend a funeral in heaven. Not going to be any more death. Just read that in Revelation 21. Not going to have to worry about anybody dying, going to a funeral. Let's look at another one. You will never turn on a light switch in heaven. Why? Why do you think? What? I can hear you. Yeah. God is there. Jesus is there. They will be the light, folks. We don't have to worry about a light bulb. We don't have to worry about Georgia Power. <laughs> you know, you're going to be in heaven. We're going to have all the light we need. And Jesus says, I'm the light of the world. If he's the light of the world, boy, we're not going to have to worry about Georgia Power or any other power. Then another one. You'll never face a temptation in heaven. Why? Satan is not going to be there. You're not going to have to worry about Satan. No temptation. Let's see, we got two or three more, and you might get out early. <laughs> You will never visit a sick person in heaven. Not going to be any more sickness. Another one. You will never lock your doors in heaven. And somebody said, are we going to have doors? I don't know. <laughs> Jesus says he's going to prepare a place for us. We don't exactly know how, what it's going to be like, but does it matter? If you're in heaven, are you worried about your doors? <laughs> it doesn't matter, folks. But the bottom line, you're not going to have to lock your doors. You're not going to worry about, you know, I go to the Y here in Rome, and I, and I took, when I bought my Highlander, I took my horn off. You know, when you click it, it'll give you, a, the horn will blow. And I, don't want, I don't want that. I, but I look back, I got lights. My light will blink. Uh, so as I, sometimes I forget to lock the car, the Highlander. So I get up on the steps at the Y. I'm getting ready to go in the Y. I can turn around with my key. And when I, if I see the lights blink, I know it's locked. I'm not going to have to worry about that in heaven. You're not going to have to worry about any locks. Let's look at another one. 
you will never see an old person in heaven. Now, I just read it a little while ago. We're going to have new bodies, people. And Jesus says in 1 John 3, verse 2, Beloved, beloved now are we the sons of God. Does not yet appear what we shall be. But this we know, when we see him, we will be like him. What a blessing. This old body, decay, we don't have to worry about it anymore. We'll be in heaven. And then the last one. You'll never shed a tear in heaven. You'll never shed a tear. I call my niece in Montgomery today. And... Uh, was talking with her, had sent her some pictures. And, um, you know, before I could get off the phone, she was just crying because of the loss of my brother. But, um, and for some reason, the minister at the services asked me, do you want to do some reflections? And so I agreed to do that. And so I had to really be strong for everybody else to talk about my brother, the oldest brother of eight children. So I uh, had to really, you know, be strong to try to not break down with them that would destroy them. But um, we can look forward to a better place. And so uh, you are going to get out early, but not but two minutes. <laughs> but thank you so much. Michael is going to be back next week. Uh, he's going to have two lessons. And then, of course, I'll come back. I'm working on two lessons for you. Um, and we'll pick up there. Let me thank you for your presence here tonight. Thank those who are online, and I hope you'll take some thoughts from the lesson. Uh, sometimes we try to take too much from a lesson. If we can get two or three good points and hold on to those, um, that, can be, make, that can mean a lifetime, uh, make a world of difference. So hold on to the good things. Let me do the announcements, and then we'll, we'll close.